So metaphor, mirroring and sharing, story a sapient instrument. And um, timing is one of the secrets and the magic of the story. And there is so much which happens in the dark and in the unknown part of the stories. And then there are things which are non-verbal, non-communicable only in language, but with, with presence, with unexpected circumstances and hearing is one of the primary generators of communication, empathy, understanding and bonding. It is the first sense that which develops already in the six weeks of, um, of an embryo, but by six months it's completely fully developed and it helps the child orientate for the exit duck head first, but also it already knows the mother's voice, the father's voice, the environment. So human beings have similar beginnings, some Beginnings are harder, some beginnings are just how life is. But cultures share motifs, sometimes consciously and sometimes inadvertently, because of the human need to bond, share, express, survive. Similar solutions come. This is um, a Tusha Hittite uh, culture, which has a corridor to the secret part of the ancient fortress. In uh, Kume in Italy, there is a tunnel for the Sibyl's chamber, and it doesn't look like uh, classic art. It looks almost identical as, as interiors of pyramids. So, and again, back at Hattusha, there is a tunnel called the entrance into the underworld with beautiful descriptions, descriptions. And um, it's just a symbolic tunnel, similar to the one of Sibyl at Kume in, in um, Italy. And at the end of it is a kind of a solar representation of the deity or wise person. So, um, since the 19th century, with the tremendous um, emphasis on the uh, superiority of the Western mind, ending up with Hegel's uh, uh, declaring a moral superiority of the West, we have neglected most extraordinary human achievements, particularly in subtle area of communication, of verbal communication, of non-verbal communication, of sustaining a cultural richness and humanness. Here is the, um, an Egyptian um, kind of blessing of the future pharaoh and uh, both deities are holding uh, ang, which is like a cross with a, with a circle or ellipse about it, above it, which is also in ancient Egypt called the mirror. So they are giving him and mirroring him into existence. This emblem was adopted by the Coptic Christians and um, their whole idea of this and other world is expressed by the same connection to the other world as the ancient Egyptians, their predecessors. 
That is how they built their own places of worship, dug into the ground. The important part which um, I wanted to bring here, and that is why I made this kind of archaeological introduction, is the extraordinary um, vitality and determination of survival. And oral traditions are the key to that. Things have been transmitted for thousands of years. But if the danger is then extermination of the wisdom holders and those who hold some knowledge, people find the way. And there was a library, an uh, ancient library, hidden in the cave um, and discovered in Egypt in uh, 1945, the Hamadi Library. And it is mostly uh, for forbidden and forgotten, un uh, recognized Gospels of Mary Magdalene and um, other um, people around uh, Jesus, um, but also uh, surviving the earlier Neoplatonic documents, which are also um, connected to Egypt. Both um, um, Pythagoras was trained in Egypt uh, for 20 years before he returned to Greece and uh, Plato as well was um, there and that con and Egyptians in their own um, documents pay particular homage, complicated homage to Egypt. But the, the poem of Protonoia, the thought that dwells in right, and I'm going to read you line by line, because it's at the root of many oral traditions and we'll touch upon it later. So I will just read it to you to get a sense what they have preserved. I am Protonoia, the thought that dwells in light. I am the movement that dwells in all. She in whom all takes stand, the firstborn among those who came to be, she who exists before the all. I move in every creature. I fertilize myself and I breed and mate with those who love me. I am the fulfillment of all. Mary Othair, the glory of the mother. I cast voice speech into the ears of those who know me. I am the voice speaking softly. I dwell within a silence that surrounds everyone. It is the hidden voice that dwells within me, within the incomprehensible thought with the incomprehensible silence. So these notions of origins articulated sometimes just with simple geometries, two circles touching each other become the root of the equilateral pyramidal concepts, even used in Chartres for this main entrance image as a hidden understatement. The neural signals which we pick from each other, we mirror, could be described with a diagram like this. In many cultures inadvertently, which don't even know about each other, certain senses of geometric but not 
uh, unfelt, not without an allegorical and metaphorical meaning, as metaphor and symbolizing are the only neural events which integrates the two hemispheres and the being of the person. That's why the ancients have paid such a great attention to the rhythms and the meaning of the myths and stories, particularly taught. So here is an Egyptian mirroring being given to a future pharaoh. And um, contemporary scientists uh, um, explain that um, initial mirroring and curiosity is the root of the world making and of theoretical mind. The children spontaneously enact something primeval and ancient while their parents are shocked. And it's a loop. It also happens when the story is being truly held. You don't know who is mirroring whom anymore. And of course, the irresistible desire to give something which one was given to someone else. And learning from the grown-ups how to be serious. In ancient culture, the children were given responsibility. They saw their um, elders and um, parents learning things and were completely involved, part of the most important rituals, not segregated into children programs and children games. So this um, intensity of the oral tradition, I want to visit through a work of a contemporary um, writer, Karen Blixen, who wrote under the pseudonym of Eastern Denison. Her, her own story, um, which I would touch later, it's very interesting. Then she, as a um, upper class um, Danish person, felt claustrophobic with the minutia and um, limitation of her class uh, position. And so she chose um, to go to Africa and completely immerse herself both in the native African community and um, with uh, the um, Islamic community of Somalia. She was in Kenya. Anyway, she wrote um, uh, short stories, but the blank page very delicately and just at the beginning shows her connection, deep connection to the oral traditions, which is very rarely written anywhere and it's almost hidden in the story. So she starts her story by saying, by the ancient city ga gate sat an old coffee brown black veil woman who made her living by telling stories. And um, she immediately, from making it uh, look like something orientalist and, um, you know, like um, um, both idealizing and um, showing it as uh, lesser than the West, turn it and talks about 
the oral tradition. And that is why it's in this lecture and why I'm sharing with you. With my grandmother, she said, I went through a hard school. Be loyal to the story the old hag would say to me. Be eternally and unsfavoringly loyal to the story. Why must be that, Grandma? I ask. I am to further you with reasons, Baggy, she cried. And you mean to be a storyteller? Why? You are to become a storyteller and I shall give you my reasons here then. When the storyteller is loyal, eternally loyal and unswaveringly loyal to the story. There, in the end, silence would speak. When the story has been betrayed, silence is but emptiness. But we, the faithful, when we have spoken our last word, we hear the voice of silence whether a small sluty lass understands it or not. And she made living by telling the stories. And then she continues, I was my mother's mother's, the black whale dancer, the often embrace, it was my mother's mother, not I was, sorry. It was my mother's mother, the black-eyed dancer, the often embrace, who in the end wrinkled like a winter apple. And crouching beneath the mercy of the veil, took upon herself to teach me the art of storytelling. Her old mother had taught it to her, and both were better storyteller than I am, but by that, by now, it's of no consequence, since the people, they and I have become one, and I am most highly honored because I have told stories for 200 years. So these words could and introduce a most interesting short story, blank page, which is available free on the uh, internet and you can find it. And she also completely dispels the Orientalism by, and this is an Orientalist painting, by telling that this woman sitting at the uh, city gate in Asian environment is telling story about Portugal. So I'm not going to tell you the story, but I'm going, while I'm showing you the images of the story, which if you read it, you would see why I showed them, they are uh, reasonable images. Uh, I would quickly tell you about Karen Blixen and why she is in this discourse, because it's for the volume which was to be a conference, but now it's the volume about um, Euro-Asian stories beyond the boundaries. Now the paradox that both Asian and European thing have met in Africa through an aristocratic dance, Danish lady who is a most amazing storyteller, and through a flow of ideas from Persia by Qadiri, Order of Sufis, and by Sheikh Ishaq bin Ahmed, who had to flee um, in a similar way like um, um, Rumi and his, his father and other people who were the, the thinkers and the wisdom holders at that time had to flee into Anatolia or up Silk Road to, to China and other places. So there, a Somali um, a kind of major domo is connected to that. And clearly, he is also 
giving Karen Blixen, who is a talented storyteller. And she told story orally for 20 years until she lost her place in Africa, had to return, and only then she began to write. So she was, com she was completely connected to the oral tradition, and she would tell to her friends as well as uh, indigenous people who can share the language. So, um, somebody who wrote um, something about her, um, interviewed her, said that she um, explained her relationship to her major dharma as a creative unity. And this kind of thing is, this is just parts of the story, which if you have time to find and read, but don't worry, I know we are all busy. So it will be very rare to find this unless one has been lucky. There are people who are anthropologists or folklorists or musicologists, they go to places, but because they are closed, they are in the Western superiority. They have never been told the secret, but some are introduced. So I'm going to now go to the subtext and back to the West and show you uh, two actresses at this kind of turn of the 19th and 20th century, um, and to kind of uh, introduce the deeper subject of subtext, but because um, subtext is part of the of the theater training and language, and um, in a declamatory theater like um, uh, Comédie Française and um, you know the sort of Shakespeare com companies in, in England, the, the big gesture, the sort of dramatic pose, and outer costuming is what was valued and considered, you know, that is a theatre. But Eleonora Duse, who was a contemporary of um, um, Sarah Bernard, and Sarah Bernard had tremendous quality in that genre. Eleonora Duse played uh, one particular role, the same, which was Sarah Bernard and is um, a lady of chameleons, which ends with her a tragic death. And when Sarah Bernard uh, dies in theatre, the audience claps and shouts, bravo, bravo. When Eleonora Duse dies, there is a silence and the audience is cry. And Eleonora Duse says, if the sight of the blue skies fills you with joy, if the blade of grass springs up in the field, has power to move you. If the simple thing of nature have a message that you understand, rejoice for your soul is alive. So, communicating that through an acting, through a story, or a piece of music, or a good lecture, and not this one, but I'm thinking of uh, my friends. So that kind of quality, when there is an interior contact, does bring connection. We are not just bodily being entertained or stimulated. Something very deep happens which is the sapient, the neural food that from which we grow, our experience grow, 
we might not be able to experience what a beautiful play gives us. But because it's communicated deeply, we also have that experience. She says, I did not use paint, I made myself more. That communicates. The old Ashik singers, the storytellers, had that quality. They knew how to do that. They saw it modeled non-verbally in front of their eyes by their teachers and they are able to project it generation after generation. In my paper, I um, work with this material much closer. Here I only uh, would touch upon it, but I wanted you to see this title because women throughout history, through the nourishment, and rearing the family and holding their community together have been carrying extraordinary levels of knowledge. This is a prehistoric fresco of a wailing woman from um, Apulia, southern Italy. It's in the Museo Nazionale um, in Napoli. But um, the women are still doing this dance. Until the 60s, they were wearing this costume. Now they're just doing it in a black dress. Nevertheless, that kind of solidarity and profound understanding and unity was part of the bond in thin and thick through crisis and through joy. The, there is a particular relationship to return of birds and um, uh, women wisdom holders, which I can't uh, go deeply into it, but here is a Mongolian a woman with her drum and the birds. And this is from Reza Sultanova's an event with the wisdom holder, who is basically um, high um, um, dedicated to um, ancient de deities. She only wears the black scarf in the back. Umai is her uh, archetypal connection, but she is in a Muslim country. And also these uh, events have survived through the um, um, Russian um, Soviet times, women have been holding, holding them together. And one can, uh, the, the woman who is holding the place is very quiet, just there in the background. She's only known because of the white scarf. And this drum has been one of the ways women in many, many cultures um, have been communicating to each other and giving release to the inner tensions, worries, and needs to come through. And rigorous training. Some of these healer women have more training than any psychoanalyst or doctor. They know medicine, they know sound, they know many things. This is from one of our plays where we enacted such a young woman, fully trained, who had to emigrate to America and brings that knowledge. Well, they think she is dumb and stupid. She is the hero of the play. And the deep commitment and the seriousness of women who hold the place for other women this is similar like an Italian tarantella, and I have written about it in, I think, in two papers for, uh, for Ege, um, one the edges of language which um, Zuleika edited. And this uh, woman holds the space 
watches carefully. She's never in drugs. She knows how to bring the person to a transpersonal, sapient, shared space and help her come back and integrate into her world. The situation might be hard, but she goes back. In the Pompeian fresco, we see the example of the same thing. The serious woman watching or a woman who is just abreacting from going through certain internal journey. So, I will touch upon some of our work. This is uh, not our work. Uh, but um, to uh, give you a sense of both traditional and contemporary storytelling, not as a revival, but as a lived cultural experience. But I'm putting this in just here because this is a Bosnian Balkan uh, oral singer, la maybe last one in the 30s, who was interviewed. He uh, can sing and tell legends and stories, both for three religions which were there, or even four, um, the Catholic and Orthodox, obvious, the Muslim and the Jewish. But this instrument, Gusle, has a horse's head and a musicologist, I think by now they do, but you know, when I grew up and I, I was, um, I had mentors who were musicologists. They couldn't explain why horses had. Well, Mongolian Morinkur and other um, instruments in the Turkic culture are made of horse. Horses bone, horses hair, horses skin. And connection between the Danube and the Balkans, the Euphrates and the Asia was much more strong and poignant in the prehistoric and ancient times and is recognized since the 19th century. So in our storytelling, we start not with how the story should be told. We start from the person who wants to tell the story. We are not interested, interested to be slick we are interested to genuinely tell something which this person would like to tell. And they might just feel they want to tell, but they don't know what. So we start from the person for the person. So this young woman told the story in the outfit which she inherited from her grandmother about her grandmother. A beautiful story about grandmother was looking after a baby lion from the zoo because they didn't have a room for it and eventually it went to the zoo. And so when she visited the zoo, they, the lion would put its uh, paws outside, would embrace uh, this, this old, and people were just surprised because it was his mother. So stories like that. So contemporary approach to oral memory, storytelling worship, workshop, narrative moments, anything that happens in time could be a story. And we also had a, in Istanbul, that was our first uh, event um, in um, 2012 here, and uh, it was same type narrative moments, anything which happens in time. And we only had this drawing on the um, lid of the lemme um, cheese, and we went down to the waterfront in um, Kadikoy and um, just um, played with it. And suddenly the ship was coming, so we waited until it came. So, these were the aspects of the workshop. 
lyricism and scale of a story, from open process to thematic kernels. Chance favors the prepared, improvisation, embodying of the ideas, visible and invisible. So I just put some images from our performances, which would indirectly give you a sense of these ideas and aspects. And this is also in the paper, which in, is going to be in Zuleika's um, volume of stories. The non-verbal non element is as important. Space and visual boundaries, tangible and implied architecture of performance space, energizing the space for the sharing of stories, group dialogue, non-verbal air. the teamwork, sometimes not smooth. Human beings have all individual needs and cannot be always synchronized, but something happens in working together. The storyteller's bodies and voice, public and private, storyteller's secret, I and not I, paradox of sharing, costumous talisman, personification process, individual characters. These are the strong elements which one doesn't need to know them when they are embodied. They come to life and they communicate. This storyteller told the poignant story from African-American history, which he deeply understood and felt. This piece was enacting all kinds of aspects of the relationships, functional, dysfunctional, completely nonverbal. This is the moment where she becomes a harp and he plays, but they are in the net and outside of the net. And the textile becomes as strong as any story language could be. And the costumes in themselves, sometimes not explicable, but atmospherically communicating presence, poetic, dreamlike qualities. Timing, composition in time. Modalities of organizing time. Sequences message. Timeless and contemporary techniques. This is our ship. And we perform the um, memories of, it was a ship in the war and it had only mostly men, but we had a play of enacting their uh, dreams, memories, uh, wives they left behind. And it was enacted first for the audience in the outside of the ship and then um, at some other moment inside the ship. So, and on with mountaineering roads. But we also worked on a small scale. This was a disabled woman by the polio when she was born, and she was carried We had a performance on the first floor, and afterwards she said, I want to work with. So we designed this throne, uh, turned her wheelchair into the throne, designed 
things for her to stand up. First time in her life she stood up. But she has a great poetic communication. She can use her arms, head and upper body. And this was the piece called Zen Waltz, playing a Japanese lullaby. The, the dancer, male dancer, was Filipino, she was Chinese. It looked as if she was moving him, but really he was moving her. They were in sacred unity, telling an incomprehensible story of human resilience. So, collaboration is not easy. It is not a collage. It is a unity in diversity. So briefly, I wanted to show you that, and I started that at the beginning, that in the traditional society, children are shown skills not only cultural skills, all skills, but here, look how serious everybody is. It is not frivolity or condescension. The children learning is not segregated from life. They witness, they understand. Here in this um, example, um, the people sitting on the ground might be doing the ritual next few months, but the most important, if you see right there on the left, a person sitting with a stick, clearly an older person, holding quietly this whole ritual is the key, the presence of the living wisdom hall, not somebody on some pedestal, but living is the path. Here in India, the children of all ages are introduced to a, in a festival. Surviving Native American communities hold multi-generational meetings and worship and remember their stories and their histories and difficult histories as well. The child is brought in the Caribbean, which has preserved lots of memory from Africa. Lots of these costume, costumes are very similar to West African and the music and the rituals, but the little boy is brought held to witness. And mastery of an instrument or anything takes 10 years of daily practice. Ultimately, that is which gives a regenerative neurological food for those who listen to the music. In the traditional societies, people with disabilities have a place. Lots of remarkable ashiks have been blind, but able to communicate profound regenerative communications. But now, we listen to what and how fast. The simple presence of someone who can perform and someone who can listen. It's completely different to 
the loudspeakers who are trying to stimulate the body because it's beyond the natural audibility and it's destroying not just the hearing but also the balancing which is in the ear that primeval thing given to us already in the womb our treasure our first inkling of memory and this is a picture of a friend of friend's child brought to a pop concert and the child spontaneously did something so giving the responsibility caring for the learning and just simply care being together look at the sense of this uh, Albanian players, the difference and oneness. So, be faithful to the star and favorably faithful to the star. who dreamed in the 25th chapter of her dream that she was a bird in the cage looking at this place, slightly frightened, when in the 24th chapter of her dream she was free, still trembling, looking at the place. And in the 23rd chapter of her dream she turned into a peacock, watching at the game of cupids who look half carved in marble, half real. And in the 22nd chapter of the dream, she felt she was a breeze, a wind of feeling in that place, wind of something, moving even the heavy curtains, drapes, carpets hanging on the balcony. And in the 21st chapter of her dream, she realized the year was 1486. She began to recognize in the 20th chapter of her dream details of the place. Same in the 19th, the carvings, even the shadow of an apple in the 18th chapter of her dream, and the corner of an eye. And in the 17th, she remembered herself as a little girl, watching the serious conversations of others. And in the 16th, she saw herself in the cage, outside the cage, a carpet, a daily life of that city, the carving. And in the 15th chapter of her dream, she saw him, whom she loved so much. He was unaware. She secretly watched him, escorted by guards. And in the 14th chapter of her dream, she remembered her father, who was serious and solemn, but lovable to her. And in the 13th, she knew that she was the bird above the city and all its part. When suddenly, in the 12th chapter of the dream, a spark blew out of the cloud, out of the sky, and out of her heart. And in the 11th chapter of the dream, she saw her city offered to that spark. And in the tents, she saw him, more splendid than ever, escorted by a friend, wearing a bishop's clothes, but much too young for the bishop, 
And in the ninth chapter of her dream, she watched the details of his clothes, the embroideries, the tassels. When in the eighth chapter of her dream, she realized he got wings, like her wings, which she was flying about the city. And she did see and remembered all the things she made and embroidered, all the preserves and the food she ate and cooked herself. And in the fifth, she remembered her favorite dress. And she realized she was the girl. She was herself kneeling in front of the window. And outside the window, he was kneeling too, looking straight into her eyes when she lifted her. And from that look, an energy of unbearable, beautiful, strong energy went straight into her heart in the first chapter of her dream. And she woke up the girl of today dreaming. And she saw the reproduction she bought in the museum the day before. But the experience remained. And we are told that in dreams, we dream backwards from the essence of the dream towards the details, the beginning. But because of our sequence and conditioning in time, the sequence of events follows. But in dreams, like in dying, there is neither time or space, but, but only the soul. 